It's my big pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ellen Ryloff as the keynote speaker for our workshop. Uh, we've been following and been very impressed by her work for a long time, so we were very, very excited to uh, uh, when she accepted our invitation. Uh, for more background, uh, Professor Ryloff is a professor in the School of Computing at the University of Utah. She received her PhD in Computer Science from University of Massachusetts. Her primary research area is in, of course, NLP, with an emphasis on information extraction, effective text analysis, semantic class induction, and bootstrapping methods that learn from unannotated texts. Professor Ryloff has served as general chair for the MNLP 2018 conference, program co-chair for the NACL HLT 2012 and CONO 2004 conferences. She's been on the NACL executive board for 2004, 2005, and uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, the Computation Linguistics Editorial Board and Transactions of the ACL Editorial Board. And in 2018, she was named a Fellow of the Association of Computation Linguistics. And uh, she will talk uh, to us today about reasons to love rules in NLP. So we're very excited about that. Before we get started, some rules of engagement. Uh, let's try not to interrupt the speaker. So if you have questions, please uh, post them in the chat window. And uh, if it's a general question, I'll wait until the end of the talk. If it's a clarification question, I will interrupt uh, Professor Ryloff and try to, to solve that on the spot. All right, so it's all you. Okay, let me share the screen here. Okay, so you can see my slides, I trust? Yep. Okay, great. So um, yeah, thank you for that kind introduction, Mihai. I'm really happy to be here. So I thank you to the organizers for uh, for the invitation. And uh, yeah, before I get started, let me say a little bit about the outline for the talk. Um, first of all, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of background just to, to introduce you to some of the things I started working on, which were pattern-based, rule-based methods and kind of give you some background about my perspective um, from the early days, if you will. And then walk you through what I think are three interesting sort of use cases for uh, using rules in natural language processing. And um, one thing you may see from the get-go is that um, one of the points of my talk is to kind of uh, hopefully convince you that rules have many different uses in NLP systems, some of which you may not have thought of as rules, but they are there lurking in our systems and I think are very important rules, uh, use for rules. So. Um, hopefully, I'll convey that theme as we go along today. So um, my own rules of engagement here. First of all, I just want to say up front that in the spirit of this workshop and promoting uh, healthy discussion, uh, different viewpoints, I'm going to use the term rule pretty loosely today. Um, I, it may refer to any sort of symbolic method that involves pattern matching or logical criteria or heuristic rules, um, but I want to sort of have everyone hopefully keep an open mind as to what I mean by rules. Um, and uh, so just keep that perspective in mind as well. And I found this cartoon uh, somehow on Twitter not too long ago. And it, of course, thinking about the workshop, it spoke to me. Uh, I think there's a lot of truth in this cartoon that if you look behind many of our AI systems, uh, they might be big giant machine learning, deep learning models. There's a lot of rules lurking inside underneath in various places. And we don't normally think of them, we don't notice them so much because they're not the main focus of the paper, but they're there. It may be something as simple as a filtering process to filter out certain aspects of the data before it goes into the system, um, all sorts of other places that they lurk as well. So um, again, that's one of the themes of the talk today, that rules are kind of everywhere in places where you may not have thought about them before. Okay, so let me start out sort of acknowledging, I think, from the get-go, right, that there are haters out there. Um, rules don't always get as much respect as some of us would, would hope they would get. Um, there's a lot of common perceptions out there. Some of them, I think, are misperceptions. So let me just sort of state some of the common ones that I've heard before. Um, you know, there's sort of the reviewer number two viewpoint that, you know, people say, oh, they're too simple. This is just such a simple method. I've got to reject it. It's not interesting if it's simple. I'm going to provide a counter argument to each of these in a minute. Um, there's the grad student viewpoint. I've heard these from numerous grad students over the years that, oh, my paper's never going to get accepted to ACL or one of the star ACL conferences if it's rule-based. Um, 
there's the what I call ML enthusiast um, viewpoint, which is that rules are just so old school, they're not interesting that everybody should just get with the deep learning program right now. Um, and then there's the skeptic perception that people, there's some people out there who think that rules just can't work, that they're too brittle, um, they just not going to work as well as a, a more complex, um, fancy machine learning model. So let me provide a quick sort of my own opinion counter to those views. First of all, I personally believe very deeply that simple is good. And, and I would hope that other people would feel that way too. Um, I don't know why anyone would want a big complicated Rube Goldberg machine uh, when something simpler would work just as well. So of course there's the question, will it work as well? But when things can work as well, I think simple is a virtue and, and not a bad thing. Um, and I found this quote from Leonardo da Vinci. I don't get to quote da Vinci every day. So um, I really like this one though, that he allegedly said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And I think there's, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, this argument that it's rules versus machine learning, I believe very much is a false choice. I think that, that rules uh, and machine learning can peacefully coexist and more than that synergistically coexist. And that's one of the points that you'll see running through my talk today. Uh, I use a lot of machine learning too. I love machine learning. I have no problem with it whatsoever, but I think they can complement each other in a variety of ways and then sometimes even need each other. And so, um, so I wanna try to dispel that myth. Um, and also this belief that, you know, star ACL papers uh, can, can't be accepted um, if they have rules. And I think that there's lots of rules in our star ACL papers. Again, maybe in places you don't see them. We don't see these big expert system like papers so much anymore that are, are only consist of a big list of rules. But there's a lot of rules lurking inside many of our ACL papers today. And I think... Um, that's something that I wanna raise awareness of as well. And then finally, um, rule-based systems really can work remarkably well in, in some scenarios, not necessarily every scenario, but there are definitely cases where they can work incredibly well. In fact, I just finished reading a dissertation from, uh, he's, he's an interesting guy, he's doing computer science work, but he's a veterinarian, so working in the field of veterinary medicine. And he did some rule-based, um, approach to, to recognize antimicrobial agents in text and compared it with a neural net model and his rule-based system did better um, by several points. So there are definitely applications, I think, especially when you're working in a specialized domain on a fairly narrow task, when rule-based methods can work, uh, can work very well. And then the last point, which is also going to be um, really the focus of the last part of my talk today, is a little bit of a soapbox, I admit. Um, but I want to kind of try to make the case that um, NLP researchers really, sh we should be spending more time on trying to understand the language phenomena that we're trying to model. I think this is a really important aspect of NLP. Presumably most of us got into this field because we love language, we're fascinated by language. And I think that trying to understand the underlying phenomenon is really important to advance the field and to ultimately make our models better over the years. And rules can play a really important part in that process, I believe. So again, I'll come back to that point in the last segment of my talk today. Okay, so the last part of the background section here is I'm gonna give you all a ridiculously short summary of my history with pattern-based approaches. This is sort of how I grew up in the field. And hopefully that will sort of paint the picture, provide some perspective for my comments later on. Um, when I was a new grad student in those days, back in the late 80s, early 90s, this is how we spent our days, was writing rules by hand. This was what it meant to be a graduate student in natural language processing. And I spent many months, probably years, I hate to admit it, um, writing what we called lexicosyntactic patterns to extract information. And the task that I worked on a lot as a graduate student was extracting information about events. And so just as an example, um, I'd read text after text after text, day after day, and we kind of look at the information that we wanted the system to extract and the contexts where the information lived and create patterns that were sort of something like this, where if you see uh, the verb assassinated in the passive voice, then the subject 
is probably going to be the victim of the assassination. And so we'd write a little rule or pattern to extract that syntactic subject as the victim of a murder event. And they got a little fancier than this sometimes with semantic constraints and checks and things like that, but that's sort of the basic idea. And the lessons that I learned from that time period was that handcrafted patterns can work very well. I mean, we ended up building a system that, that worked reasonably well. It was, of course, far from perfect. It's a hard problem, but, but patterns really can be quite effective. Um, but it's also very tedious and time consuming. It, it wasn't the most fun part of my life, <laughs> spending hours after hour defining all these patterns and rules by hand. And so as I became a more advanced grad student, my first uh, vow was never to write patterns by hand again. <laughs> At some point, I sort of got to that point where, oh, I was tired of doing this. And I wanted to try to figure out how to automate this process. And so I started introspecting on how I did this as a human and eventually developed a method which came to be known as autoslog to reverse engineer patterns from annotated texts, basically. And um, just to explain the name a little bit, we used to talk about this process of reading texts all day long and defining patterns by hand as slogging. It was like our slang. We just slog day after day, creating patterns. And so if we're going to automate that process. Of course, it should be called auto slog. Um, and it was really just based on very simple syntactic heuristics that were sort of mimicking what I felt I was doing when I'd read these texts day after day. And that is the input would be some sort of a sentence. And again, some part of the sentence was labeled as this should be extracted with some sort of a semantic tag, like the mayor was a victim in this context. And the output would be a pattern that was a more general way of recognizing contexts that, that would extract uh, references to victims. So the input now was just a sentence that was annotated and the output was uh, a syntactic pattern. And the lessons that I learned here were that heuristic rules can be used to learn patterns. And so what we have here is actually rules being learned, being used to learn rules, right? So two different uses of rules here. Um, they're not perfect though. And in this particular really early method was, was far from reliable. I think only about a third of the patterns that it created turned out to be useful. About two thirds were problematic. But on the other hand, a human could go through and look at these patterns and manually filter, separate the good ones from the bad ones. And that turned out to be a whole lot faster than trying to devise these patterns from scratch. And so now instead of reading text day after day and figuring out what the pattern should be, I was just looking at a set of proposed patterns and deciding which ones seemed reasonable or not. Much, much, much faster. Something you can do in a matter of days as opposed to months or years. Okay, so eventually, thankfully, I did graduate and became a faculty member. Um, but in the back of my mind, I still had this idea going on that, you know, we should probably have some statistics to go with our rules because it was actually quite hard to judge how good, how effective a rule would be just by looking at the pattern in isolation. And I would do a lot of grepping to kind of look for where the patterns occurred in the corpus, but, but some sort of statistics would be really helpful. And that led to the next model, which was called Autoslog TS, um, because I'm not very creative and the best I could think of was Autoslog the sequel. So that's actually what the name means. But the idea here was when I generated a pattern to apply it to the corpus again, and look to see what percentage of the phrases that it found actually corresponded to things that were annotated by the humans. And so we could generate some probability estimates that, that gave us some idea of how effective the pattern would be. This turned out to be incredibly useful for a couple of reasons. One is that patterns that had a low probability could be automatically discarded, right? They're almost certainly not gonna be useful, just get rid of them. So that was a huge improvement in the number of patterns that needed to be reviewed. And also the probabilities provided a tremendous guidance to human reviewers, okay? And so just to clarify too, the probabilities were things like this, where I would just estimate the probability that if we applied the pattern that some entity was assassinated, the likelihood that that entity would in fact be annotated as a murder victim in the text. So this sort of a pattern might have, I just made this up, but maybe like 88% estimated accuracy. And this was incredibly helpful because I learned during this process too, that people are not necessarily very good at judging the utility of a pattern or rule. 
<laughs> uh, sometimes they are, but they can also be wrong a lot. And this was brought home to me once by a pattern that the system learned that was windows of X. And it came up showing 100% probability of extracting a bombing target. And at first I thought it was a bug in my code. I'm like, windows of something? That means it was bombed? What is going on here? And when I actually looked at the texts, it's because this was a corpus of you know, various kinds of terrorist events or criminal activities. It wasn't random set of texts. And the reality is that you know, journalists don't mention the windows of a building in that sort of a context unless something bad happened to the windows, right? So windows were pretty much only ever mentioned when they were blown out in an explosion. And you can argue whether you know, that pattern by itself is still not necessarily useful, but it definitely changes your perspective of a pattern to know the context in which it occurs. And it's certainly a clue if you're in, working with this sort of domain that if you see the windows of the building are mentioned, it definitely increases the likelihood <laughs> that that building was involved in some sort of an explosion. And so it can really work that way where there's a pattern that you would assume is bad, but then you see strong statistics and you think about it some more and recognize it actually might be really helpful. Or the other way around where there's a pattern that you think, oh, certainly that would be a good pattern, but then you see a low statistics and you realize, oh, this word is, has a whole nother meaning or it's polysemous or highly ambiguous in some way. And in fact, that's the dominant use of that phrase in this corpus and that's gonna be a really noisy pattern. So the, the moral of this story here, and the reason I wanted to talk about this a little bit is because I think that humans definitely struggle to judge the effectiveness of patterns and rules sometimes when they're seen in isolation. And that's where statistics, probabilities, um, and any sort of feedback that you can get from a large set of text um, can be extremely helpful in the process. So there's a synergy here between rules, patterns, and statistics, probabil probabilistic methods. Um, and the other thing is that these statistics can dramatically decrease the time needed for human review, not only because the bad stuff can be quickly discarded, but also it provides a ranking of the output of the system, and you can prioritize the items for human review based on the most likely uh, rules being, being looked at first, right? So if you have a limited amount of time for a domain expert to look things over, the data gets prioritized based on these probabilities. Okay, so that's the background, really whirlwind tour of some of the earlier work in pattern, um, pattern matching and, and rules for information extraction. And what I want to talk about now is some of the work that followed from that um, in my research group mostly, and talk first about bootstrap learning, which has become a really common theme in a lot of my work. Um, and I don't know how many people are familiar with the bootstrap learning paradigm, so let me kind of briefly introduce that. Uh, bootstrapping comes from the old expression, you know, somebody pulls themselves up by their bootstraps. And the idea here is you have some sort of a self-sustaining process that proceeds without external help. So our NLP systems that use bootstrap learning will start off with a very small amount of human input of some kind. They learn some information from that. Then they use what they learned to learn more things and use what they learned then to learn even more. And this is an iterative cycle. So they usually begin with a hopefully large collection of unannotated text, so no human labeled data, just raw text for your domain. Um, there's some sort of a seeding strategy, and this is the human supervision, and this is gonna be what I'm gonna focus on because that's where the rules kick in here. It's usually some sort of a rule-based strategy. And that provides some sort of label data for the system to learn from. And then there's an iterative learning process. And so basically you've got some sort of rule-based approach that's being used to kickstart a learning process. And then the learning process um, iteratively expands and learns more and more stuff on its own. And why bootstrap learning? There's, a, there's some reasons that are maybe fairly obvious and some that might be more subtle. Um, as I've already said, manu manually annotating data or doing things by hand is, is time consuming and it's expensive, and it can be deceptively difficult for some of our complex language tasks. So if you can avoid the need for human annotated data, or at least reduce the amount of data that you need, that's, that's a big win. 
Um, and there's been a lot of emphasis in our field on crowdsourcing as a, as a cheap way to get lots of labeled data from people. And that's great when it makes sense. There's some applications where that works really, really well, but there are others where it doesn't. Um, it can be very expensive um, to do crowdsourcing on a large amount of data, or if you've got a complex task, um, you also have to do a lot of sort of checks for quality assurance. It's a bit of a process to get really high quality data out of crowdsourcing. And there's a lot of applications where you have sensitive data and you simply can't give it to random people on a crowdsourcing platform. Right? It might be data in the medical domain, which has all sorts of privacy restrictions. It might be data that's just licensed um, for various reasons. It, it could be proprietary data inside a company. There's actually quite a lot of data that you just can't arbitrarily share with other people. And a lot of the real world applications for natural language processing um, require domain expertise. <laughs> and that's an issue. Domain experts have very, very limited time. I don't know how many of you have actually worked with hardcore domain experts, but it's always a wake up call to me at how little time you can get from them. And that's not a knock on them. Many of them are very excited about the work and they're, they're happy to help in principle. They, their time is just very valuable. Um, and they have a lot of demands on their time. And you know, I think in the medical field, that's an area where you're, you're very familiar probably with the difficulty in getting doctors or other medical professionals to sit down and annotate for a long time. That's very hard, but in other fields too. I recently just finished a project with JPL researchers, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. These are planetary scientists, right? And they were very excited about this project. But then I asked them, hey, can they you know, annotate some data for us to solve their problem? And the conversation is, well, I can give you an hour this week. <laughs> maybe two hours this month, right? They've just got so many things going on. You, there's not a lot of time to, that they have to commit to these things. And the other thing is that whatever annotated data you can get from the domain experts, I personally believe that it's most important to use that as evaluation data, because that's where you really need to make sure that your models are gonna be evaluated fairly and you've got high quality data. If you can get away with what I call silver data for training, so kind of slightly noisy data, then that's okay for training. Now, how much noise you can tolerate, that's a question, but I think it's okay to get away with slightly noisy data for training, and then you can reserve the really high quality gold stuff for your evaluation data. And then finally, just a, maybe a plea um, as a natural language processing person in general, it's really unrealistic if we think about it to expect large amounts of manually annotated data for every single task in every single domain. I think that's a little bit crazy. And so I think it's, it's a good thing if we can develop techniques that, that, that really minimize that need. Okay, so these bootstrap learning strategies, they have to get started with some human data. And again, that's where the rules come in. And I want to sort of emphasize that there's a lot of different strategies that have been used for bootstrap learning. Um, one of the most common is just seed words. And you might say, well, that's not a rule, but it is a rule, really. It's just a very simple rule. <laughs> the rule says, if I find this word in a certain context, then I'm going to assign a label to that context based upon the label that the word had. So you can think of it as, as a simple rule. But there are also bootstrap learning methods that begin with patterns. Um, instead of individual words, there's methods out there that can use just logic rules, heuristic rules, and actually rule-based classifiers that consist of a set of rules that were developed by hand. So I'll go through a couple of examples of these um, just to kind of illustrate how this works. And before I get there, though, I, I want to make one more point about the idea of the seeding process. And the key point here is that actually seeding heuristics to label training data can in some cases be preferable to small amounts of gold data. And the reason for that is a little subtle, but it, it corresponds to what I think of as mostly universal truth, which is that more training data is better, right? Almost always, at least to a point, the more training data, the better. And with seeding heuristics, there's the opportunity to get really, really large amounts of training data. If you can come up with a good seeding heuristic and you almost always have lots of unannotated data, just raw text for your domain, then there's the opportunity to automatically 
label lots of the unlabeled text and end up with a lot of the silver data that you can use for training. So these methods, if they work well, you can end up with a lot of training data for your system. And it is going to be a little bit noisy. Um, but in my experience, at least most of the time, a whole lot of slightly noisy data is often better than a very small amount of truly gold data. The key is controlling the noise. You want good seeding heuristics. OK, so let me just show you a few examples of this kind of thing. And I want to do a shout out, too, that a lot of my work in this bootstrap learning space was really motivated by some of David Yurowski's early work uh, on word tense disambiguation. So if you haven't seen this work, it's very, very cool stuff from the 1990s. And he's, uh, the task he was working on then was word sense disambiguation. And he did it with bootstrap learning. And there's a couple different experiments described in that early paper. But the best system that he ended up developing um, basically tried to distinguish between different word senses for a word based on other words that occurred in its context. And the method that he used um, was to identify one word that was a really strong indicator for two different senses. So for example, the word plant can refer to a factory facility or it can refer to a life form. And he would just start with one seed word for each. If I see the word life in a sentence around the word plant, or in the context around the word plant, I'm going to label that instance of plant as a living thing. If I see the word manufacturing in the context around the word plant, I'm going to label that instance of plant as a factory sense. And so that's just these seed words would allow some of the context to be labeled. Most of them were still unlabeled, but some of them could be labeled. And then he actually trained up a little machine learning model, rule-based machine learning model back then, to figure out how to identify more contexts and then applied that in sort of this self-training iterative loop. It was a very, very cool method. Um, and also inside this paper is an additional rule, which he called the one sense per discourse rule, which is a heuristic based on the observation that if you see a word and recognize that it has a certain word sense, let's call it sense A in this document, there's a very, very high chance that all of the instances of that word have the same sense. That is, we rarely mix different senses of a word in the same discourse or document. And so that can also be used as another rule that helps clean up maybe errors that the classifier made or fills in cases that the classifier couldn't label. And um, that plays a prominent role in this, in this paper as well. So another way that rules can be applied as heuristics um, for fixing or adding labels to things. OK, and the, the task that I've done a lot of work in this space on is lexicon induction. Um, so mostly I'm going to talk about semantic lexicon induction, um, though there's other kinds of lexicons too. Probably many of you are familiar with sentiment lexicons, uh, for example. And the general approach, not just my algorithms, but others as well, there's a bunch of people who've done work in this space, kind of looks like this, where you have a whole bunch of documents, not annotated in any way, just raw text and some seed words in this case, just examples of whatever category of things you're trying to learn. So if you're trying to learn words that refer to cars, you might have 10 example car words. If you're trying to learn a list of things that are animals, you'd start off with like 10 animal terms. Okay, so let's imagine we're trying to learn diseases. We might ask someone for, let's say five or 10 disease words. And then we identify the contexts that consistently occur with those example terms. And we might learn some patterns of rules, like when you see infected with something, often it's a known disease or hospitalized with something and so on. And then you can look at the words that occur in those contexts disproportionately and extract those out and make a leap of faith that they are also members of the category. So we learn some more disease terms, add them to the dictionary, and then you can learn more context and you can learn more words and you learn more context and you learn more words. And this is just a, an, iterative process that bounces back and forth between generating new patterns and generating new words. That's the, again, very general sort of outline of this kind of approach. Um, the algorithm that we came up with in 2002, this is a student of mine, Mike Thalen, some years ago now, that worked better than some of the previous ones was to make the observation that a single rule or pattern is often 
uh, not that reliable. There's so many contextual issues. There's so many idiosyncratic word uses that even sometimes patterns that you think are super reliable, uh, it's hard to get really high precision from a single pattern. But if you can generate sets of patterns that you recognize are useful and use them together, words that consistently occur in the same set of contexts as others turn out to be, um, that, that's a pretty reliable, much more reliable way to do this bootstrapping. And so we came up with this algorithm called Basilisk, which is also a reference to a cute little lizard that looks something like the little icon on my slide there. And um, again, I'm not going to go through the details, um, but again, it uses multiple patterns to infer new words for a category and then use the new words to learn more patterns and so on. And I want to briefly just also mention the real strengths of this kind of um, empirical bootstrapping from a corpus in that you often learn a lot of things that are not in your official repositories. <laughs> Um, so even if you might say, well, we've got WordNet, why do we need to learn semantic classes? There's always a lot more terms out there that you want to be able to recognize that might not be official terms. So for example, when we worked on disease outbreaks, um, we found a whole lot of spelling variants. <laughs> These are all uh, the, the terms that you can see on the screen here, not the official terms, um, slight misspellings or just spelling variants. There were shorthand ways of expressing things. Um, you know, people should say Kawasaki's disease, but a lot of times they just say Kawasaki, right? Um, there's creative hyphenation of all kinds. Even the word flu in this big medical dictionary we had at the time, the OMLS Metathesaurus, flu was not in there. Maybe it is today. Um, influenza was in there because that's the official term for flu, but flu actually is a shorthand term, right? So. And there's all sorts of uh, acronyms, abbreviations, YF for yellow fever, JYF for juvenile yellow fever, and so on. And so these sort of bootstrapping methods are, uh, that's one of their strengths. They learn a lot of terms that you really want to be able to recognize, even though they're not sort of necessarily the officially approved terms. Okay. But back to rules, um, again, this sort of method can be used for all sorts of things. I did some work with colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, Janice Weeby and Teresa Wilson. Some years ago, we used exactly the same algorithm to learn subjective words um, like hope, grief, joy. Those are positive or negative terms. Um, find patterns associated with those terms. Use those to learn more subjective words and so on. And some work I'm gonna describe at the end of the talk today as well. We also recognize the need to learn verbs that are associated with affective polarity um, to know whether if something happens to you, is that a good thing or a bad thing that happened to you? So this is slightly different than sentiment. They're verbs that have positive or negative polarity to the person who experiences the action. And the key point I'm putting this on the slide is because we used a very different kind of pattern here. Here we recognize that conjunctions actually might be the most effective kind of patterns or rules to use. And this was because of prior work that we'd uh, read about uh, out of Columbia, where they recognized that adjectives in conjunctions almost always have the same polarity. Right? So it's very weird to say I was happy and disgusted. <laughs> we don't mix polarities very much in conjunction. And so we hypothesized that would also be true for verbs. And it turned out to be very true for verbs. So we simply did this bootstrapping off of conjunction patterns. And it worked really well at finding more verbs that had the same polarity as the seed verbs. OK, and just to sort of round things out, that there's other kinds of seeding strategies, too. Um, we've used heuristic rules for seeding strategies, some work from long ago with my student, David Bean. We were working on co-reference resolution. One of the challenging problems there is recognizing existential noun phrases that may not be referential with anything, right? I can just talk about the police, the law, the truth. I've never mentioned it before. Um, it looks like it should be anaphoric because it begins with the, it's a definite noun phrase, but they're not. And so we did some work on learning those iteratively, um, beginning with syntactic heuristics to sort of find the easy cases. And also we did work on trying to find patterns where pairs of patterns could help you resolve co-reference issues. So for example, if somebody was kidnapped and somebody else was abducted, you know, two, two or three sentences apart, probably it's the same person. Uh, depends, right? But if you've got a pronoun in one of those 
roles, then it probably refers to the, to the person in the earlier pattern. And so again, we use syntactic heuristics to resolve some of the easy cases, find these pairs of phrases that were co-referent, and then use those pairs to learn to recognize patterns that were associated with co-reference. And in some work again with the University of Pittsburgh folks, um, actually we developed rule-based classifiers to do the seeding. And so this is a case where my colleague, Jimmy Sweeby, she knew a whole lot about subjectivity. That was really her thing. And we wanted to do some bootstrapping to, to build up a sentence classifier. And she said, oh, I can write some quick little rules <laughs> to find some of these easy cases and we can use those as training data. And she did, she sat down and she used a sentiment lexicon and just wrote some quick little rules about finding lots of clues or not finding any clues. And that was a high precision, but low recall classifier. The idea here is to write rules that help you find some cases with high reliability, not necessarily all cases, but the cases you find if they're reliably labeled can then be used as training data to feed into a machine learning model. And that's exactly what we did. We used these again to train up, um, I think it was an IE Bayes classifier at the time. And um, it was a great way to, to kickstart um, a machine learning approach without having to do human manual annotation. Okay, so that's the first bit of my uh, uh, argument here that one of the roles that people don't always think about for rules, but I think they should, is bootstrap learning, that these seeding strategies that kickstart bootstrap learning are rule-based approaches. And, and I encourage you to kind of think of them that way and, um, and argue that that's a great approach for many of the problems that we have in NLP. The second use case for rules that I wanna talk about a little bit is harvesting data. And some of this overlaps with bootstrapping, but it, not necessarily. You can harvest data even without bootstrapping. And so the argument here is that sometimes you're working on a problem where you're trying to find instances of something and you don't even know where to get started, right? So you might be trying to generate phrases or, or pairs of things or combinations of things. How do I go out there and find it? Well, sometimes it's fairly straightforward to develop rules that in contrast to the previous case where we had high precision, low recall rules. Now we're, we're trying to design high recall, low precision rules. Rules that can go out there and harvest a lot of potentially relevant stuff. And then you can pair that up with your favorite fancier model, it might be a graph algorithm, statistical model, deep learning model, it can be anything you want to kind of sift through everything you've harvested and separate the wheat from the chaff. Okay, so that's the idea here to use rules to go off to some sort of a corpus, or these days we all play with prompting methods, which I'm gonna argue is very similar to rule-based approach, um, but trying to generate information to consider and then try to apply other methods later to figure out which parts of the data really are the good parts versus the not so good parts. So the example I'm gonna talk about mostly here is a lot of the work that's been done on, on hypernym and hyponym learning. So some of you may be familiar with this. Um, this work I think was really jump-started by Marty Hurst in 1992 with this seminal paper that made the observation that there are hyponym patterns that can be used to extract hypernym, hyponym relationships from text corpora. And so the idea here is that if you can just go search through a corpus or issue a web query for hypernym such as blank, <laughs> you can extract the information you find in that blank position and recognize that based on the language, it's a member of that category. And you can just harvest lots of members of a category by searching, uh, for, uh, again, a large corpus or the web with these sorts of patterns. And she identified several of these patterns, hypernym such as, hypernym including, hypernym especially, or star and or other hypernym. So for example, suppose I wanna learn lists of artists, right? I can just go out there to Google and issue a query. It says artists such as star, and then download from the snippets that I get, the phrases that occur in that asterisk position, 
and <clears throat> voila, I'll get lots of artists. Or if I want to learn dog breeds, I can search for dogs, including star. I can find fruits by saying fruits, especially star, <clears throat> or star and other vehicles would generate vehicle terms. So that's the idea that Marty Hurst put forward back then. And this is an incredibly <clears throat> highly cited paper. Lots and lots of people have, have made use of these hyponym patterns in, in a variety of ways. Um, I also want to mention that um, a, a colleague that I worked with in 2008 when I was on sabbatical at the Information Sciences Institute, <clears throat> Zonitsa Kozarova, she and, and I and Ed Hovey at the time, we did some work on trying to um, create even more reliable patterns, which we call doubly anchored hyponym patterns. And this was Ornitz's idea. She made the observation that actually, if you use one of these hyponym patterns and give it one class member as an example in a conjunction, it becomes a lot more reliable. So there's lots of challenges with just extracting information from that asterisk position. But grounding the pattern with an example makes it all work much better. So now my query I would issue would be something like artists such as Picasso and star, um, dogs such as terriers and star, fruits such as apples and star. So this is what I mean by, by harvesting data with patterns. You can apply these sorts of patterns to, again, the web or a large corpus, extract all this stuff from the blank position, the starred position, and you've got a lot of candidates. It's still pretty noisy, though. <laughs> There's a lot of subtle issues with trying to reliably extract information um, from all the varied contexts that you might find these patterns in. And so you need some sort of a secondary process to kind of clean things up. And in this particular case, um, we used graph algorithm, graph properties, put all the information into what was called a hypernym pattern graph, um, designed a couple of metrics. The simplest ones work the best. And one of them was popularity, that how many different times was this term found by another term in a query. Um, the other direction that we called productivity, which is if you then take a learned term and try to learn more terms from it, does it work? And that turned to be incredibly valuable. Um, and then finally, also just mentioned that we ended up in a subsequent paper turning this pattern around and using it in the other direction too, where if you search for the hypernym by giving it to members, you can learn new hypernyms as well. So we'd have a pattern like star such as member one and member two. Um, so to learn information about animals, for example, we might give the query star such as lions and tigers. And then you learn other possible hypernyms for those terms like felines, mammals, predators, and so on. And this led to a very effective bootstrapping process where we learned, it was actually two levels of bootstrapping. You could learn lots of hyponyms from your first example term. Then you'd learn more hypernyms. Then you learn more hyponyms from it. And you could really learn a whole lot of semantically related stuff through this method. But the key point is that it all started with a set of rules <laughs> that revolved around a bunch of examples of your hypernyms and hyponyms, and then some subsequent method later that sort of tried to, to clean things up statistically or through graph properties and so on. And just to illustrate again the generality of this idea, um, I also want to just point to some more recent work that I did with a student of mine, Tianyu Jiang, fairly recently. We were trying to learn goals that are associated with locations. That is, these are like specific, not ju just geographic locations, but like facilities or, or physical artifacts that you would go to, like a store. And the idea is that they are knowing the reasons why you go to a place is essential to a lot of inferences that we make. So if I say that she went to the supermarket and got chicken, I'm assuming she purchased the second chicken because I know that's what supermarkets are for. Whereas if I say she went to the restaurant and got chicken, I'm assuming she paid for it, but also that she ate it. <laughs> Whereas if she went to the supermarket, I don't make that assumption. Um, or if I say she found a sweater at Macy's, I'm gonna assume she purchased it because I know that Macy's sells clothing. If I say that she found a sweater at the library, I'm not gonna assume she purchased it because that's not what libraries are for. And so how do you even get started on a task like this? That was our first question. And we turn to patterns, right? So you can use to find some rules to harvest potential goals and location pairs from a corpus, in our case, using syntactic relations. 
And so we designed some dependency relation patterns. In this case, the pattern is somebody went to some place to do something. And you harvest locations and actions that co-occur in the syntactic construction. And that gives you candidates. Now it's still very noisy, you need to clean it up, but that's phase two. <laughs> and so the first part is to apply rules to harvest lots of potential candidates. And then the second phase is some subsequent model that kind of, again, tries to separate the wheat from the chaff. And that in that case, it was a label propagation algorithm, but I'm not gonna go through the details there. Okay, so I think I've got about 10 minutes left, which is perfect. Um, whoops, and that's going to take me to the last use case that I want to make an argument for in terms of rules. This one's a little more out there, but um, I hopefully I'll be able to convince you that, that it's a good use of rules. And that is understanding language phenomenon. We don't think of that as our central goal, but we probably should think of it as at least a central goal. And I'll start this part of the talk with an, a little story, actually. So some years ago, it was about 2013 or so, I had a bunch of students in my lab who got along really well. And they just came down to my office one day and said, hey, we'd really like to work on a paper together. And I said, great, what do you want to work on? And they said, sarcasm. And I said, are you serious? <laughs> I wasn't sure if they were being sarcastic. And they said, we're very serious. We think this is just a great problem. And I said, I agree, it's a fantastic problem, but it's really hard. Do you have any ideas about how you would solve it? And they said, no, we don't. And I said, okay, well, go start reading through lots of sarcastic stuff and, and see if you can come up with some ideas. So they turned to Twitter, um, which has the advantage of having hashtags. And so they just downloaded lots of tweets that had a hash sarcasm tag. They're not all sarcastic, by the way, but many of them are. And then came back to me a little later and said, I think we're onto something. We found lots of tweets that seem to share a similar pattern. And the tweets that they showed me looked like this. Oh, how I love being ignored. Absolutely adore it when my bus is late. I'm so pleased mom woke me up with vacuuming my room this morning. Thoroughly enjoyed shoveling the driveway today. I love working on Saturday. And they said, these tweets all seem to have both positive and negative sentiments in it. So we'll just grab some sentiment lexicons and look for tweets that have both positive and negative stuff. And I looked at this and I said, hmm, not exactly. What these tweets have are positive sentiment expressions. Um, so words like love, adore, pleased, enjoy, those would be in a sentiment lexicon. But the negative stuff are events not really sentiments, right? So being ignored, my bus is late, being woken up by vacuuming, shoveling snow, working on weekends, those are stereotypically negative events, not the kinds of things that are explicit emotions or things you'd find in a sentiment lexicon. And so that led to this hypothesis that we had that a lot of Sarcasm, not all, let me say that up front. Sarcasm is a very, very complex phenomenon and there's all different kinds of sarcasm. But there's a common type of sarcasm that is born of contrast between a positive sentiment and a negative event or state. And it's the juxtaposition of those two things that creates the sarcasm, okay? So I'm gonna talk about this contrast pattern of having, in this case, a positive verb phrase expressing a sentiment and a negative situation often an event. Um, and it can occur, just to be clear, the other way too. It can be negative or phrase in a positive situation, but this is the more common pattern. And so to kind of test this hypothesis, we designed two structural heuristics to try to mine this information um, from tweets and see if we could recognize more sarcasm that way. And the structural heuristics were twofold. One, if we found a sarcastic tweet, meaning a tweet with a sarcasm hashtag, that included a known positive sentiment term like love, then we would assume that the event that follows it is a negative event, right? In other words, we found the source of the sarcasm. Or the other way around, if we would find a sarcastic tweet that included a negative event that we could recognize, we'd assume that the preceding verb was expressing a positive sentiment. Again, that we found the source of the sarcasm. 
And so these are two structural heuristic rules that we devised based on this hypothesis about one type of sarcasm that we um, seem to have recognized and created a simple little bootstrapping algorithm to use it to mine more uh, information. So here's the bootstrapping algorithm, really simple, based on those two structural heuristic rules. We started off with one word, love, it's the seed word, and just extracted sarcasm tweets with the word love. And then we'd extract the event following love and assume it's negative. So we'd extract being ignored as a negative event. Then we'd look for more tweets that contain that event, like I adore being ignored, and extract the verb as a positive verb. Then we'd find tweets that contain adored, extract the event, in this case, taking exams as a negative event, and just keep doing this back and forth. Okay, very, very simple. There's a little bit more behind the scenes. There are actually probabilities and some statistics in here to do it a little better, but that's the basic idea. And what happened is we learned some interesting things. We learned some positive verb phrases. We learned some positive predicate adjectival expressions. Um, and we learned over 200 negative event phrases. And you can see there, not all of them are, are good, but many of them are. People generally don't like being sick or waiting or cleaning or being yelled at or paying bills, um, doing homework. Those are all sort of stereotypically negative events. But the point I wanna make here um, really is that the point of this paper wasn't to produce state-of-the-art F scores <laughs> or to produce state-of-the-art lexicons. Those are small numbers, right? Um, we did have a lot of experiments in this paper that showed the accuracy of what we produced and, and that they had some value and that this contrast was important. But we never made any claims that we had the best sarcasm recognizer on the planet. The contributions really were the investigation of this insight about language that we thought was central to at least a subtype of sarcasm and that could be useful for detecting and maybe generating sarcasm. Um, and then highlighting also in here the need to recognize affective events, which I'll come back to in a minute. And I'm very satisfied to say this has ended up being one of my most highly cited papers because people took this idea and did lots of things with it. And, and that's been very gratifying. And so the point here is if you think about the approach that's used here, it's rule-based, it's very simple, <laughs> right? but it was used to explore a fundamental idea about language and shed some light on it. And I think if you do work along those lines, it's very valuable for the community and can be very, um, very interesting as well. And along those same lines in, in the last five minutes or so that I've got, um, I wanna talk about the most ambitious work that I've actually done in terms of really deep language understanding. Um, this is some work that my PhD advisor, Wendy Leonard, did a long time ago in the 1980s, is had this idea of plot units were very, very complex knowledge structure designed to understand uh, narrative stories and the events that took place. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I'm sort of running out of time. But the key idea behind these structures is that in order to understand stories and plots, we have to understand the emotional reactions of people and the interactions between the characters. And an awful lot of this revolves around not explicit emotion, but events and understanding how events impact people. And so this early work was, it's a terrific paper. If you're really interested in deep language understanding, it's one of my all time favorite papers in the field. I highly recommend it. Um, but it required a massive amount of manual knowledge engineering, just incredible amount. And so my colleague at Utah at the time, Hal Domey, and one of his students, Amit Goyle, the three of us sat down and said, let's see how far we can get with current NLP methods. Can we automate the process of these plot unit structures? And we started this work in about 2009, continued to about 2013. Uh, and I just want to show you an example so you can kind of illustrate, understand what I'm talking about here with plot unit structures. Here's a really little story. When John tried to start his car this morning, it wouldn't turn over. He asked his neighbor, Paul, for help. Paul did something to the carburetor and got it going. Oops. And so we start off understanding that there's a negative event here for John. His car won't start. So he's in a bad mood. Okay. So again, it's not an emotional statement, but we know he's not having a good day. He's got a problem on his hands. And so he tries to solve the problem by asking Paul for help. That's a mental state, a desire to 
kind of get some problem solved. And Paul agrees to help, which is also a mental action. And then fortunately, Paul is able to fix it, gets the card started. So it was a successful plan. And that this little arc, um, the T arc, indicates that the, the car now works. And so now John's in a positive state and the negative state no longer applies. That's just, again, these plot unit graphs get really big, really complicated, um, but you can kind of get a gist of how capturing uh, what's going right or wrong for people and the interactions between people really is fundamental to understanding stories. Okay, so we decided to try just creating a system to automate the process of generating plot units. Could we do it? And of course, we started with the idea of trying to maybe use machine learning, but well, it took the three of us pretty much an entire semester to label just 34 Aesop's fables. We started with Aesop's fables. These are short. It was a monumental effort. Um, and we quickly realized there's no way we're going to be able to have enough training data to create a machine learning system. So we adopted a rule-based approach. We decomposed the problem into four subtasks and created a rule-based component for each. And the four tasks, um, one was recognizing affective states. We tried using the existing tools that we could find, which were sentiment, lexicons, frame net, speech act, verbs, just to recognize positive and negative states that people might be in. Um, there's some character identification called reference resolution. Off-the-shelf systems didn't work at all for Aesop's fables because they're mostly focused on animals, even though they're referred to as he and she. But a simple little rule-based method worked just fine for these little stories. Um, and then we had to design some affect state projection rules to map the affective terms onto the characters. And then finally, some of those links we had to create, and that was just a very ad hoc, uh, small little component. We didn't spend a lot of time on that. So there were these full rule-based modules that were kind of cobbled together to create plot units automatically. I'm going to skip the rules in the interest of time. What happened from this work, and here's the really the key point I want to make. First of all, we gained a huge understanding of some of the NLP challenges that remain for narrative text understanding. We are a long way <laughs> from being able to truly automate the process of these kinds of knowledge-rich um, structures for language understanding. Um, we now have a baseline system so that if somebody comes along and figures out how to do better and automate it, they can compare their results to this. And, and that would be great. So we've got some idea of how, how much we can do and how much we can't do. But we also really came to fundamentally recognize that the biggest missing piece here was the affective events, that this was a whole giant component that none of the existing resources can capture. I think only about 4%, 4% of the emotional information was explicit emotion. The rest was all derived from from events. And so that led to a whole research agenda that my students and I are still to this day continuing to work on, which is developing models to recognize affective events. And also, I just, you know, it's one of these efforts where I really hope it will motivate some other people to work on some of these really challenging um, problems. And, and there's all sorts of in other directions that I think um, people could go based on this kind of kind of work. So I feel like it was uh, that paper was entirely rule-based. There was no machine learning of any kind, um, but there was a whole lot of good things that came out of it um, uh, for me and hopefully for others as well. Okay, so that's uh, the end of my talk here. And just to sort of recap the main messages I'm hoping to kind of um, share with you. First of all, that a lot of different things can be meant by rules. And I wanted to kind of uh, give you an open mind about thinking about rules in different ways and different kinds of rules and ways that rules can be used. Not just standalone systems of lots of rules, those exist of course, but also rules can be used as a component inside other systems synergistically with other methods to generate data and bootstrap learning for harvesting potential data. They really can work synergistically inside a variety of different other methods and models. And also to argue that I think rule-based methods can be extremely valuable for gaining understanding and insights about language, decomposing complex tasks, maybe some parts of the task you can use machine learning for and others you can't. So do a rule-based system and make some progress here. Um, and just shedding light also on the current capabilities and limitations of our system. And, and finally, my own personal belief is here is that um, 
I love everything. I love rule-based approaches. I love machine learning. I love deep learning. I like it all. I want to solve problems. And I think we should avail ourselves of all the tools that we have in our arsenal and just try to solve problems in whatever way makes the most sense. So rules are an important part of that in, in my view. So thanks for your time. And I'll be very happy to take questions. Thank you, Alan. This was fantastic. I love every minute of this talk. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, but I don't want to dominate the discussion. And we should let the audience uh, chime in. And we already have a question from Dane uh, about the promise about ranting about F1 scores. <laughs> uh, oh, you're asking me to rant? Is that what you're doing? Here? Um, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so look, I, 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 I'm glad we formally evaluate our systems. There's huge benefits to that. I'm not against it, but it shouldn't be all we do. And so whenever my students write papers, I always try to impart on them. You have to be able to articulate some contribution of your work beyond an F-score gain. Um, because F-score gains by and of themselves aren't really uh, useful to other people. Right? I want to write papers and do research where people have an idea that they latch onto that they can then use in their work. And if the only idea in my paper is my F score is higher than your F score, um, first of all, that's nothing that other people can benefit from. And also it's going to be obsolete in another year, right? <laughs> F scores are meant to be broken. And so I think it's, it's really important as a community they were always focusing on the ideas behind our work and, and not just the evaluation scores. I can't hear you, Mihai, are you muted? I was muted, thank you. Uh, for the audience, if you have questions, please raise your hand or type the questions in the chat window either way. And while we wait for questions, I'll start with mine. As a small comment, I never knew what TS in Aldous Lock TS comes from. So I learned that uh, today, which was a very new piece of knowledge for me. Uh, but I, like I said, I love all the comments and I agree 100% with all the comments you made. And uh, I completely agree with the comment that simple is good. And I mentioned this a lot to our students. But my question is, how would you convince reviewer number two that simple is good as, as sort of as an extrapolation, you know, about proof by obfuscation. And now I've seen recently more and more papers that are sort of accepted by obfuscation that their they propose models are so complex that they're sort of impossible to verify, but they look super impressive. So you cannot reject that paper. So how do you go around and convince reviewer number two that simplicity is good? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think you do have to fight this head on sometimes because that perception is out there. Um, and I think one way to do that doesn't always work, but one way is to really um, try to be transparent about the, the challenges behind the complexity of the model that you're competing with. So for example, some of these really big deep learning architectures, and we've all heard this joke, right? That, that getting the best score is graduate student descent. Right? <laughs> Grad students play and uh, this incredible amount of hyperparameter tweaking and that sort of thing. And, and people just kind of um, push that under the blanket sometimes. And, and just the, the training time, I mean, the, the GPU requirements on some of our fancy models and or the amount of training data, but trying to explicitly articulate why my simple model, the, the practical advantages that my simple model has over the more complex model matter, whether it's computation time, whether it's hyperparameter tuning, whether it's data requirements, whatever it is, kind of trying to be really upfront about that. Um, it could also be generalizability sometimes that some of these components don't generalize as well as others or can't be used in other domains when your rules can. Right? Not always. Again, it depends on the situation, but yeah. I, I'd Thank love you. to hear other people's ideas too, because I, I definitely believe we need to, to yeah, get man. this across. <laughs> I think this is a good sort of point to plug in the panel what we'll have in a couple of hours. Let me check the time. I think it's going to be at <clears throat> 11.30 local time in Korea, and I'm sure we'll revisit some of these issues there. 
Uh, we have a question for uh, from Clay. Clay, do you want to answer it? Ask it yourself. Oh, uh, sure. First off, a uh, fantastic talk. Really loved it. Um, so my my question is, you know, given the deep net language models, uh, particularly like embedding models, have been found to kind of vicariously capture all kinds of interesting structure that people get very excited about. I'm wondering if there's ways that your bootstrapping kind of approach might actually help with uncovering some of that structure that might be there and whether you had any thoughts about that. Um, that's a good question. One of the one of the things I'm kind of interested in, and I haven't really done much along these lines yet, but I think there are benefits to explicitly mining a corpus that are lost in some of the giant pre-trained language models. And trying to, to do some experiments that compare how much you can, you know, in a corpus, the examples that you find, how many of them are recoverable from the language model, I think would be a very interesting thing. And you could certainly experiment with different subclasses of things based on um, bootstrap learning of different kinds of things and see how much of them you can get in the other approach. Um, not sure if that made sense, but. Um, yeah, it does. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm muted again. Uh, I had some follow up question to Clay, but uh, uh, I would let Gus uh, take the next one. Actually, I, I sort of want to change my question. You, you'd mentioned now when uh, you saw prompting as as related to rules. I was wondering if you'd say a little bit more about that idea. Yeah, sure. Where... So, yeah, I, I um, when I look at prompting, I think of pattern matching. <laughs> I know they're not exactly the same, but there's all this work now, right? There's an high, entire industry on prompt engineering. And that's really writing patterns in my view. Um, you're just trying to extract the information instead of explicit extraction through pattern matching, you're trying to do it through generating and elicit whatever is buried deep inside the language model. Um, but people will spend lots of time prompt engineering and that's apparently okay. <laughs> but writing those same sorts of patterns as explicit rules is somehow less okay. And I think, um, that's just an example of, of the ways in which we need to shape the narrative a little bit to, to help people understand um, what they're doing and make relations across different tasks. Um, yeah, that was actually exactly one of my questions. As, as a small parenthesis, which should make you feel better, Ellen, we, we have an internal experiment where we compare prompting against bootstrapping. And we, by bootstrapping, I mean the iterative algorithm. And we found out that bootstrapping actually outperforms prompting in the same conditions. So it's still your research still holds, you know, with all these advancements, you know, you're just sort of pushing all the scores up, uh, which is actually a great segue towards Lynette's question. Lynette, do you want to uh, ask it or should I read it? Um, okay, I can ask it. Yeah, first of all, thank you for a great talk, Ellen. Um, thank you. What I'm wondering about as somebody who organizes challenge evaluations, um, particularly in the bio domain, what kind of challenge tests and, and in particular additional metrics um, should we be thinking about? Um, the, one of the things I've noticed in say biocreative, but I think it's true in many evaluations is that because creating the data is so expensive, there's a tendency to want to have very generic tasks. And mm -hmm. um, you know, so maybe if we focused more on portability, or you just mentioned compute cycles, or something like that, we would, you know, debugability. Um, we might do better at getting at some of these issues. So, over. yeah, that's a that's a great question, and and in fact, one of my um, uh, I don't know what to say disappointments, I guess, with the and maybe some of this is my own fault, but the bootstrap learning work, that really frees you up to test your approaches across many tasks, many domains at the same time, because you don't have to generate much training data to get things going. There's still evaluation data challenges, but, um, and, and yet you don't see people do that very much. And I think 
I think that's something as a field we need to emphasize more, although <laughs> there's a counter argument to that too, which is I'm kind of not personally all that excited by, you know, here's a giant suite of 20 different tasks and watch the F score go up 0 0.01 on all of them. Yay, this is great. Um, uh, so I, you don't want to make them too general, I think. But let me give you one example to kind of illustrate maybe what I mean, that relation extraction. I think something is fundamentally wrong with the way that we approach relation extraction in our field because we need training data for every relation. How many different relations are there on the planet? Billions. I mean, is that really the right approach that, yeah, you just give me some training data for every possible relation you could ever want? That just seems wrong. And so some way to kind of test your models, not on everything on Earth, but on a variety of different relations that are at least sort of in the same space somehow, I think uh, would be a very important thing. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, no, that, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, interesting. And I see your, I see your comment too about the F measure. Um, I'm not sure about new metrics, but I say, and this is Dane's fault because he asked me to rant. So once you get started, um, the one of the pet peeves I have about a lot of papers today too, it's, it's, it's worse than just focusing on F score. It's only focusing on F score. People don't even bother reporting recall and precision breakdown anymore. So often, how many papers I can tell you there's just an F score and recall and precision is so important to me to really understand the behavior of a system. And they average over thousands of categories together. Okay, maybe not thousands, but but all the time. Here's, here's a macro averaged F score over 10 categories and that's all you find in the paper. And just the seemingly simple thing of demanding that we show F scores for each of the categories separately and that we show recall and precision breakdowns or graphs or you know some way to get inside the F score would be a, a big step forward, I think. So that's my mini rant there. <laughs> Dane agrees. <laughs> All right. Uh, I propose to stop here and continue some of the discussion in the panel where Ellen will join us again. Uh, Ellen, thank you again for graciously accepting the invitation and giving a fantastic talk. And uh, we will see you in a couple of hours. Well, sounds great. Thanks again. Thank see you. you all. See you all.